My name is Jessie Roth, and I'm the director of the Institute for the Development of Human Arts. I'm a white woman with dark brown hair, I'm wearing glasses, uh, black headphones, and my hair is in a bun on top of my head. I'm sitting in my apartment with some houseplants behind me and a white room. And I really want to welcome you all to Decarcerating Care, Histories of Coercion and Dreams for Liberated Futures. This is the sixth installment in our ongoing panel series that Ida has been putting on since 2020, and we're really grateful that you're here. Um, and yeah, just a few opening slides that I want to share with you before we go into the panel. So the first note is about accessibility. Live closed captioning is available for today's event. You can click the closed caption button to turn this on. We're also joined by a team of two ASL interpreters. Gratitude to our amazing access team. And um, also a note on visual descriptions, like I did at the beginning, whenever possible, we aim to provide visual descriptions. This is a description of our presenters. And um, if we can, reintroducing by name whenever a panelist begins to speak. On tech information, uh, you can reach out to a designated IDA team member, Sun IDA Tech, in the chat if you're having any technical issues. Um, as mentioned, we are recording this event to share with you all later. Um, we really invite you all, as you already are, to participate in the chat. Please feel free to use the space to share your thoughts and reactions. And um, want to name that we invite you to share your questions with the panelists. We're not going to be able to get to everything, but we definitely save the chat. That uh, anonymized version of the chat also goes out following uh, the panel, and we really like to engage with everything that's coming up for you all. So a little bit about the Institute for the Development of Human Arts. If it's your first time sharing space with us. We are a growing community of current and prior mental health service users and survivors, psychiatrists, psychologists, and other clinicians, activists, and artists. And we've all come together with a shared vision of transforming mental health care. And what we do at IDA is we advance critical, effective, and scalable alternative approaches to mental health through collaborative education and community development. So we put on classes, we do trainings, and also uh, cross-movement panel conversations like this. Uh, a little bit about what makes us unique at IDA is by integrating experiential and academic knowledge, we are challenging the idea that only those who work in the field of mental health um, are the experts. And we're really trying to shift power dynamics in a system that tends to only privilege that professional experience. Some community agreements that guide our space this evening. I wanna read these out loud. Uh, the first is shared expertise and wisdom. Everyone brings their own expertise to the conversation. We can all gain from and respect each other's various expertise. The next is collective liberation. Overcoming oppression aids everyone's liberation. It is our responsibility to challenge various forms of prejudice. We educate in the spirit of solidarity and hold each other accountable without criticizing who we are as people. And lastly, listen like allies. We respect a wide diversity of choices and perspectives, even when we disagree, and we don't judge or invalidate other people's experiences. And I wanna uplift uh, that the community agreements apply to the chat. And we have a team member, Frankie, who is kind of um, here to moderate and uplift these agreements in the chat space if needed. So um, again, please keep participating in that way and just bear these agreements in mind. So a bit about the event, um, we're gonna hear briefly from our moderator this evening, Tatiana Nduta, who is an item member. Really grateful to have Tatiana holding this space. I'll pass it to her in just a moment. From there, our panelists will introduce themselves and we'll, we'll have a panel discussion and Q&A. So um, with that, we can take down the slides. Um, again, I just wanna thank you all again for being here and I'm gonna pass it to Tatiana. Thank you, Jesse. Nedayo, peace to you all. Hello, my name is Tatiana, and I will keep. I'll give a quick, brief uh, visual description. I'm a brown-skinned woman with rectangular black eyeglasses and shoulder-length curly locked hair that is black and burgundy. I'm wearing a green flower dress with a tree of life necklace, 
and there's a bookcase and artwork on the wall behind me. Good evening, and welcome to today's panel discussion on decacerating care, histories of coercion, and dreams for liberated futures, hosted by Ida. It is my honor to be a moderator with this courageous hearts and brilliant minds, our panelists, and all of you. Throughout our discussion today, a warm reminder to please take care of yourself. Take what you need when you need it. We are at the cusp of change in the abolition movement. And there has been a resounding cry that has been echoing for the defunding of the police and prisons and addressing outdated white supremacist institutions. It is crucial to comprehend the relationship between profit and policing through the medical industrial complex, which has been exploiting marginalized communities with racist, ableist practices as an extension of state control and capitalism for centuries. Instead of prioritizing care, the medical industrial complex is entrenched in systems and ideologies of colonization, slavery, and eugenics. It is essential to lay a foundation for how we got to this present day reality. Pseudoscientific notions of racial differences and black inferiority have been formed and shaped mental health care since the establishment of the first black mental health hospital in 1807 in Virginia. Prominent physicians have propagated ideas of mental illness in black individuals to justify exploitation, experimentation, and mislabeled behavior, such as escaping slavery as a byproduct of mental illness. Even after the abolition of slavery, Southern states used the criminal justice system to control and contain black and brown individuals. In the civil rights era, we saw how schizophrenia was increasingly described as a violent social disease that afflicted quote unquote Negro men and was caused by brain dysfunction. The black psyche has been increasingly portrayed as unwell, immoral and inherently criminal, justifying police brutality, Jim Crow laws and mass incarceration in prisons and psychiatric hospitals. The, under, the ideas underpinning these ideologies persist even today, intertwined within the medical industrial complex, which is a for-profit system that is the outcome of private ownership of land, medicines, and human beings through slavery that defines what a good and healthy body is, that is highly oppressive, reductionistic, and violent. People with disabilities, Black, Indigenous, people of color, the LGBTQ, LGBTQ TSI+, our unhoused population, and all those currently detained and incarcerated as a result of the prison and medical industrial complex and other systems are seen as expendable and labeled as defective and delinquent to justify the unjust incarceration and refusal of access to qualified and dignified spiritual, emotional, physical, and mental care. This is evident in the disparities in the our diagnostic rates and the disproportionate criminalization and institutionalization of marginalized communities labeled as either having a mental illness or dangerous to self or to others. There is a direct correlation between these insidious histories and our present day efforts by the state to expand involuntary commitment. As we continue to confront the legacies of racism and oppression within our mental health system, it is crucial to create space for dialogue to center and uplift the perspectives of those who are most affected. So tonight, our panelists 
will speak on how institutionalization has been used as a tool for social control and how it is impacting their communities. They will highlight the larger pattern of the national expansion of involuntary commitment directives, discussing key current examples in New York and California. Finally, they will uplift ongoing resistance to these harms and ground us in centering liberation and healing as we translate tonight's learning into action. I encourage everyone to listen with an open mind and to engage in this critical conversation. I invite you to use a chart to share your thoughts, your feelings, your reaction, and any resources for continued learning and growth. And with that, I would like to welcome you. And for now, I'll invite my panelists to introduce themselves. They will give a brief description of their, na their name, their pronouns, who they are, and a brief visual description. And we will start with James. Hello, everyone. And thanks so much, Tatiana. That was beautiful. Uh, my name is James Birch. Uh, I use he, him pronouns. Uh, I'm on unceded Ohlone territory uh, in so-called Oakland. I'm the deputy director for the Anti-Police Terror Project. I am a brown-skinned, uh, oval-faced man. I have a small beard and mustache and a junior afro. Um, I'm wearing a gray sweatshirt and a blue t-shirt under it. Uh, and the background behind me is blurred, but you can see a bit of the gray chair I am sitting on. Thank you so much. Next, we will hear from Kalechi. Thank you, Tatiana, and your introduction was so beautiful. Hello, my name is Kalechi Ubozo. I'm also on unceded on Ohlone land in so-called Oakland. I'm a brown-skinned woman with long hair and braids. I'm wearing a green shirt. Uh, I have clear glasses on. I'm in a room full of colorful pictures and collages. Um, I'm also a mental health advocate. I'm a suicide attempt survivor. I'm a psychiatric survivor. And I am a co-editor of We've Been Too Patient, Voices from Radical Mental Health, uh, Stories and Research Challenging the Biomedical Model. Uh, and I came to California over a decade ago when I heard about the consumer movement, when I learned that there were people like me working in a system um, and trying as hard as they could in the system, outside of the system to make mental health services make sense, to make them peer driven, peer run. We can talk about what has happened in the last decade um, or how that has been co-opted, but essentially I came to California because I saw myself in the movement out here. Um, I saw myself with the great and dearly departed Sally Zinman um, learning underneath her of how to advocate. And, um, and I spent the last three years holding spaces for black folks who have been harmed by the ongoing racialized violence uh, towards us um, and police brutality and just holding healing spaces for black folks. So I'm, I'm happy to be here and happy to be in space with you all. Thank you. Thank you, Kalechi. We're excited you're joining us today. And next, I'd like to invite Chaku. Thank you, Tatiana. Hi, everyone. It's good to be here. Uh, my name is Chaku Mathai, uh, he, him, his pronouns. And I am in the Lenape homeland and the Haudenosaunee homeland uh, for work and home respectively. You know, that's uh, in uh, New York City of Manhattan and upstate New York in Rochester area. My uh, background, by the way, is a bookcase uh, with some um, pictures on the wall. Um, I'm a brown skinned man with, um, you know, wearing glasses, rectangular glasses, a short haircut, graying, graying black hair. And um, I'm also, you know, a member of the psychiatric survivor movement. Uh, one of the advocates involved in uh, advocating against forced treatment for some time now. I started, you know, we immigrate, I'm Indian and my family immigrated to uh, New York City uh, via, you know, Kuwait, where I was born. And um, 
you know, struggled immediately with xenophobia and racism that we were experiencing. And a lot of that uh, loss of safety and the assaults on me, and uh, even as a child, um, led to uh, struggles, you know, real uh, issues. Uh, you know, I started to feel my everyone was trying to harm me, including my parents, and didn't want me around anymore. And that led to being labeled with a psychotic disorder, str struggling with substance use conditions, and being treated by systems and police and community in a way that there was something wrong with me. And the only saving grace I had was my parents thought otherwise and were holding my self-determination. So I'm one of the people privileged to, to not have been forced into care because of my family supports and only stand here before, with you because of that, I think. Um, so I'm grateful to be here and to be able to advocate for the, for the liberation and freedom that we talked about and that Ida is representing. Thank you. Thank you, Chaku. We hold space with you today, and thank you for naming that. And next, I'd like to invite Theo. Good evening, everyone. My name is Theo Henderson, and I'm, I'm out of, based out of Los Angeles, California. My pronouns are he and him, and a visual description of me is I'm a brown-skinned African-American man uh, behind with a uh, comic shirt of activists uh, used as the heroes or protagonists. And behind me is a white wall, a white door, and a black microwave oven. I am also the host and creator of a, a podcast called We The Unhoused, which I created uh, being unhoused uh, for over eight years. And I created it when I was living on the street um, as also uh, being targeted by the police as being mentally ill, uh, trying to find a way to involuntarily uh, uh, commit me and so I have experience in understanding uh, how the care courts and how the police use those uh, tools to demonize and target unhoused community members utilizing those languages that uh, house people are, are involuntarily incarcerated but it's much more uh, unique and resonant and when it comes into the unhoused community because they believe the majority of unhoused people are mentally ill so Thank you, Theo, for centering and uplifting the lived experiences of on-house populations. And last but not least, I would like to introduce and invite Rob. Uh, thank you, Tatiana, and especially for that amazing uh, introduction uh, to all this that, that was very uh, inspiring to hear in some ways, just to hear it voiced so well. So I'm Rob Wipont. I'm a freelance journalist, investigative journalist. I've recently published a book called uh, Your Consent is Not Required, The Rise in Psychiatric Detentions, Forced Treatment and Abusive Guardianships. I'm a white man with short brown hair uh, and a black shirt, and I'm sitting in my apartment uh, with some uh, bit of furniture and some books and records in the background, and I go by he, him, and um, yeah, that, I think that's, that's it. That's my intro. Okay, thank you, Rob. And I know we are all eating to start our conversation. And so I will start us off just by asking, what are some of the ways you have witnessed or personally experienced institutionalization operating as a tool of social control? What has this looked like? Um, and how has this related to your work? Whoever uh, wants to go first can unmute. All right, I'll take a turn and get us started. How's that? So uh, this is Chaku. So, you know, the experience of, of being a, a young person in school, struggling, and, you know, some of my first experiences with teachers separating me from the class, bringing me up upstairs to another room. And then I quickly noticed how all of us, those of us who were in this other room meeting with this psychologist um, at, you know, only six, seven, eight years old in our first uh, grades in school, um, we're all black and brown. Um, we were all the ones that were fighting against 
a mostly all white teaching kind of institution. Um, we were the ones that questioned what we were being told to do and asked. Um, and we were the ones fighting for our dignity at times. You know, there a lot of times we were the ones defending ourselves. And instead of our white counterparts and students uh, being in the in, being disciplined, we were the ones being disciplined. So we could see pretty quickly, you know, what was going on. And uh, I just didn't know how to how to how to change it. I mean, I I mean, I even I even went to the library and brought went to the library and asked my teacher if I could find a book that would help her be a better teacher, you know. And uh, she gave me a book and the teacher didn't like it. And, you know, it was kind of the same old, same old. But that progressed into, you know, the only, you know, the only advocates I had were fortunately, you know, in that time, my family when, you know, in even in treatment centers, you know, the approach was just don't be, you know, don't be expecting too much from him. Uh, be grateful he hasn't hurt himself or anyone else anymore. And maybe, the, you know, maybe that that's what we can expect. Because they were saying we didn't come to the country for this. You know, we came for him to be able to uh, succeed and do well. And instead, you're seeing you're not even seeing him. You know, my father kept arguing for that. And even though my parents struggled with me and had my had their own struggles. Um, I mean, there were times when, you know, I I saw them as the enemy, too but they still hung by me. You know, I thought they were trying to kill me, poison my food. You know, I, I would flip tables. I would make a, you know, I, I was, I was, uh, I was, I was, a, I was somebody that they were afraid of at times, you know, including my younger sister. Yet, you know, the, they couldn't find that alliance with, with any systems at that time. And this is in the mid eighties, the best programs were long-term day programs. I was in one of those and, you know, then pulled out of school and brought back in. So, yeah, and I saw school that way, too. School was the same social control model, not wanting to ask a question as much as, you know, bank information inside of me. And that information is the information I was questioning. So um, so that's kind of a start anyway. I'm wondering if that uh, gets somebody else's juices going. <laughs> I really appreciate that, Chaku, uh, just for naming how this shows up in the educational system. And for a lot of people who eventually get caught up in this net, a lot of them, um, the first entryway is usually through schools. We find that there is just this disparate, uh, just view of brown and black uh, children in schools. And I have had experience to, uh, as a uh, therapist in training in the school systems, and you find that a lot of uh, brown and black children are usually diagnosed with defiant disorders, more than mood disorders. And you find that that's how they start to be trapped in the larger carceral system. So thank you so much for naming that. Um, is there anybody else who'd like to go? And may I add a piggyback off of that? If they happen to miss the educational um, trap of that, uh, I, bear, I beg to differ when they say where the black and brown adults, how they trap them is by catching them as saying quality of life or a person is violent and use it as the impetus for unhoused black and brown people to be uh, 5150. Um, for example, if you see, I, I, uh, I'll give you a quick example and then I'll shut up. One of the quickest examples of getting uh, involuntarily or forced to have someone pegged as a mental health uh, individual if the person is unhoused and you see them loitering somewhere. And so what they will do is they say the, uh, the person is acting bizarrely, which is, uh, or they look like they are a danger or they can be violent. And that's when you are unhoused, particularly in Los Angeles, because of the nature how they had, can do 4118, which is a criminal act for an unhoused person to sit, sleep, or lie anywhere where they're posted with 500 uh, feet. You can utilize that as a tool to incarcerate or involuntarily impose upon an unhoused person as someone that has uh, psych psychotic features or they're psychotic. Um, for example, um, they will say they're an unhoused person. Like for example, when I was waiting at the bus stop on a rainy day and had a hood, and I had my belongings, they said that I looked menacing. 
because I had a hood on. And those tools, may, uh, if you miss them in the education system, then you can utilize those same kind of tools as the adults in creating different kind of conversations of a person that's uh, hiding or, or, or doing things in the survival mode. They may not be uh, deemed sane in housed circumstances, but are survival measures that unhoused people have to take in order to survive out in uh, inclement weather, hostility from the public. I really appreciate that, Theo. Thank you so much for just naming um, this very persistent idea of cynicism and how we choose to decide what is considered normal or not uh, normal. And I love the fact that you talked about the, the conditions of the unhoused populations and some of the challenges that they have to go through and even some of the mental states being in survival mode, you operate on a very different spectrum. And we know for anybody who has any mental training, you know that when you're in survival mode, you're operating from a completely different part of your brain than when you're actually feeling safe. And so, some of the ways that uh, I can invite our participants to just think if you're part of the systems, what are some of the ways that you help propagate some of these biases? You know, what are some of the ways that you are not seeing the people who are part of the community that you serve? Or even in your own communities, what are some of the ways that? we are continuing to marginalize and keep these people hidden. And so we find it safer to be able to depend on the carceral system to just get them away from our side so that we don't have to contend uh, with what is facing us, the, the humanity, um, their, their struggles, and our inability to be able to connect with them. So thank you so much for that. I would invite whoever wants to take it next. Yeah, I, I want to follow up just a bit on, I thought Theo did a great job of describing very clearly how this happens on the street, you know, as a behavioral intervention, right? And I see all involuntary psychiatric interventions as essentially social control, because when it comes right down to it, nobody can read minds. So they aren't really seeing into what's happening inside your mind. They're simply judging and assessing and responding to behaviors. And what it's what you say and do that can get you incarcerated and can get you forcibly treated. And um, personally, too, I wanted to share that, you know, I the first time I really witnessed forced treatment was with my father. So here was, you know, an elderly, well-to-do, privileged, educated white man in a nice city suburb, you know, really all the sort of good fortune and privileges that our society can give to a person and um, with family support too. And still, he could be involuntarily treated on the basis of, of behaviors that I considered to be very understandable and, and not at all threatening, really. And, and so that really opened me up to like what a powerful tool is. That's why I want to share that story because yeah, it's not just the marginalized, the oppressed, the weak, whoever, you know, whatever groups we want to put people in who get victimized by this tool. It really can be anybody. It is such a powerful tool. Any, no matter how powerful you are in the society, this tool can can get you, and I think that's really important to know. And I, I don't want to I don't want to say it's an it's an equal opportunity tool. It's not right. It clearly is, as people are going to talk about tonight, and I'll share as well. Driven by a lot of the prejudices that that are in throughout our society, but but it's just important to know just how extraordinarily powerful it really is as a tool of social control. Thank you, Rob, so much for that. And I'll just uh, piggyback on that. Um, my experiences with institutionalization were actually similar to your dad. Um, I thought that because I was trained in mental health and I understood the system and I knew how to advocate for myself, I never thought that this would happen to me, but I was a victim of a sexual assault and I went to a sexual assault clinic to seek help. 
And because I dared to challenge um, the results of the same nurse who basically said that I was not eligible for the care that I knew was free because I've helped a lot of my other clients get access to it, she decided to uh, put me on a psychiatric hold and declared me um, unsafe to myself and to others. And so I found myself uh, having to protect myself for 16 days, psychiatric hold, and that was my introduction to this system. As somebody who was in school at the time and had been in the field for a while, I was flabbergasted at the fact that none of my professors had ever talked about it. Nobody around me had talked about this. And so for me to be going through it, and it even gave me insight on what happens in a lot of these psychiatric hospitals, you know, being there for 16 days and being almost like an insider uh, with outsider information to see the injustice, you know, to be put down by three male staff for refusing to take the forced medication, for challenging uh, a lot of this unjust uh, practices. And I think the irony of it all was in the entire time I was there, I was never given any care. The very thing that I went into uh, the system to seek out help for, you would think that they'd give me a therapist, a trauma therapist, something. I actually ended up more traumatized than I was even before going to seek care in the first place. And so and I think that's why this is such a critical conversation to have, because I don't think we really understand how far reaching the system is and just how insidious. And a lot of times it's easy to think that you're immune right? You have your education, you have your, your experiences, you have your money, you have your, your race, and those things will protect you. But as we'll see tonight, this system is so entrenched from our education to our healthcare to our jobs. And anybody can be caught up in this. And so I'm very interested to hear what uh, Kelechi has to share with us. Well, I thank you everyone who shared and that it's also so important to hear these stories. Um, I, I've split between two stories, so I'm gonna share half of one and half of the other, but I entered the system as this 13 year old black goth kid who had to move from New York to Georgia and then discovered a lot of redlining and structural racism and segregation, just things I hadn't experienced, not to say that doesn't happen in New York, but I split my time because of how school was. My mom sent me to a white school so I could get an education. And then I had an all black neighborhood and I just didn't feel like I fit in anywhere. And the one person who always saw me, who didn't, who just didn't see, just saw the whole parts of me was my grandmother. And when she, and she was just kind of the person who she just thought every meal should have a dessert. She just would kiss up my face and say, it's okay, baby. And just, she was my rock. And when she died, I wanted to die. It was, it was like, I, she was gone. I wanted to go. And it wasn't that simple. It was also like racism in school. It was rejection from boys. It was all of these things. So I was suicidal and I ended up telling people because I didn't know then you're not supposed to tell anyone that I was just like, this is how I feel. And it was the reaction to the suicide, the thought of the suicide, everyone freaked out and they were so busy trying to stop me from killing myself that they never helped me. They, they carted me away to a hospital and it was scary. I felt like I had done something bad. They, you know, I'm strip search. I'm 13. I'm scared. I don't, you know, my shoelaces, they take them, my teddy bear, they, they're trying to figure out if something's confiscated in it. And all I learned through that experience, well, one, I was told I was mentally ill. I'd never get better. They told me I had a, I, I had depression and I'd always need medication. I'd be dependent on them for the rest of my life. I'd never have a relationship. I'd probably never hold down a job. This is what I'm hearing at 13 years old. Just want you to sit with that. And what I decided was, 
I'll never tell anyone how I'm really feeling again. That's what I learned was like, I can't be in this space. Um, and this was, it was really, really scary. If we fast forward to now I'm pretending to be okay all the time. So I don't, you know, appear not sane. And the thing that no one ever did, which I thought was odd was no one ever said, wow, the matriarch in your family just died. What is that grief like? Let's give you coping skills for the grief you're in. No one did that. They said, you're bad. This is this. This is, don't do that. That means you're crazy. And here's medication. There was no like conversation about grief. And as a young person, I didn't know what those feelings were like. They were huge feelings. Fast forward to my twenties, I sexually assaulted and I attempt and I'm back in hospital and I'm in a psychiatric hospital and I have a nurse tell me, don't let yourself get raped again. This is a psychiatric nurse telling me not to let myself get raped again. And I'm in a psychiatric situation. I need to get out of here. Now, the people around me are reacting to the harm and violence. But what I am learning is how do I get out of here? I can't actually react to the harm that is is my treatment, this is care. And what was our treatment? They, we were watching Silence of the Lambs and coloring, which is a whole nother story. But that, that was, there was no treatment. There was just movie night, problematic movie night at that. But I knew in that space was, if I wanna get out of here, I gotta be a good patient. I gotta say, yes, ma'am, mm -hmm. it's my fault that someone attacked me. Let me get out of here. And I realized how much control they had on me getting out. And I was like, I'm gonna do everything to get out of here and never come back. And so I don't say that to like activate all these people. It's more to activate us to know that like when they put us away, this is what away looks like. Away don't look so good. Away is harmful. Not to mention the chemical restraints, the amount of medication I was on. I couldn't see here or there. I was half zombie and this is what, this is the kind of care we get when we're put away. And so, I mean, I, I'm sitting with that and I'm sitting with like telling you all of this and I've said it before and it's not easy to say at any time, but I say it because I don't think, I don't think my family wanted me to be harmed when they were trying to call for my help. They weren't trying to say, let me give you some trauma on top of your trauma. They thought I was going to get treatment and they did not know this was going to happen. So I say that for those who don't know, but that's what happens to us. And as a black woman, I, I was really clear about my blackness in those moments. Oh, I'm so strong. I should have protected myself. Oh, I see you. So I lift that up because that is the experience this black body had. Just a moment to just uh, hold that. Thank you so much, Galechi. For what you've shared and I'm just looking through the chat there's just been a lot of people who are just uplifting and sharing too that hey that was my experience I've been through that and in this moment I just if people choose I just want you to take a moment to just ground ourselves you know take a deep breath sip a beverage drop your shoulders Loosen your jaw. A kind reminder to take care of yourself. Take what you need when you need it. I know these conversations are heavy, but it is crucial that we have a safe space to talk, to dialogue, to share to release, as Kalechi so wonderfully said, a lot of this harm comes from the lack of naming the pain, the trauma, our lived experiences and realities. And so in this moment, I just want to give everybody here that space. We have no idea what you're bringing or what you're holding, 
But in this moment, I just want to give you that which you needed during that time. And we're going to take a shift and I'm going to ask questions of each individual and then we will have moments of reflection. Again, thank you everybody. Just remain present and just remember to take care of yourself. And so I will start with Rob. And so Rob, in the midst of this uh, mental health crisis we're facing today, the, the myth or the narrative we keep being told is it's the failures of the disinstitutionalization, which was the closure of the large state hospitals and asylums, which started in the 1950s. And in your book, you discuss how the number of psychiatric beds have arguably considerably increased since this period. So why is this meaningful and how is this indicative of an expanded social control system? Yeah, thanks for that uh, question, Tatiana. And I'm going to share my, my screen because I've got uh, uh, some slides because I thought people would appreciate seeing some of the, the actual numbers and data on this. And um, I just want to assure you, if, if you can't see the slides, that's fine. I'll be speaking to uh, all of the, the key content uh, on them. So uh, I will just switch over now. And uh, start the slideshow. Okay, so that's my book, just so you know, and you can get it anywhere right now. So just momentarily, you know, I want to talk about that dominant public narrative. I think pretty well everybody's heard this now, that this notion that there were 360 beds per 100,000 in state hospitals back in the 50s. And, and now there's only 11 per 100,000 today. And as a result of that, all these people that were removed from these asylums or discharged, landed in prison or, or homeless. And there's a quote from the New York Times there. And along with this, this notion that our, our laws have become very strict and rights protecting and consequently are even really extremely dangerous. People can't be forcibly detained or forcibly treated anymore. And that that's exacerbated this problem. So that's the dominant narrative that's out there. Here's just a, a little selection of places where I found this narrative when I was doing my research, basically everywhere from right to left and in the middle, all sorts of publications uh, and out news outlets across North America, and often using the exact same numbers because the source is usually Treatment Advocacy Center and E. Fuller Tory. They have really propagated this notion following shortly thereafter saying, therefore, we need to forcibly treat more people. So is any of that true? Actually, none of it's true. It's amazing how this narrative, despite the fact that it has almost no factual basis to it, has become so dominant. So just a quick reminder of something you probably know already, but the step one legal criterion for detention under mental health laws is always that you have a mental disorder or you know are suspected of having one. And as of 2022, according to the National Institute of Mental Health in the United States, 50% of youth will have had a clinical mental disorder before the age of 18. So that alone suddenly makes 50% of children and youth in America potentially uh, like poss it's possible that they could become subject to mental health laws. The a latest study in, in the Journal of the American Medical Association Network Open, that study found that 85% of adults would have a, two or more mental disorders before the age of 45. So what's important about these numbers, I don't take them seriously at all. What's important about them is just how how wildly you know out out of out of control this notion of, of what a mental disorder is, who does and doesn't have one. Basically, everybody has one, and so now these numbers can be used for anything, for any sort of inflammatory purpose. If we forget this, suddenly you can say, "Oh, 50% of people in prison have a mental disorder." Well, yeah, but so do 50% of people outside. Actually, 85% of people outside have a mental disorder. So what does it really mean? And it doesn't really mean anything other than you can become subjected to these laws. 
and the laws themselves have become very broad. So we're far beyond danger to self or others anymore in virtually every jurisdiction in, in North America. We Even that, as legal scholars have observed, is vague and amorphous already what danger even means. Uh, but it, and it's risk of danger anyway, not actual danger. And then also we now have risk of grave disability is on the books everywhere, meaning you might be at, at risk of potentially not being able to meet your own needs in some way. And we're going beyond that now uh, into mental or physical deterioration. The notion being that you might deteriorate in some way that could make you committable in future. That's now a justification for commitment in many jurisdictions. And it's currently the, the bill in California that's come forth. That's the criterion they want to introduce in California now. But it's really the practice in a lot of cases anyway. So, so if, if all that's true, you would assume that more people are probably being detained. And indeed, that's the data. The best data we can find suggests that. So some of these, the, the numbers I'm going to show now come from a study from UCLA uh, by David Cohen and G. Lee, and some of them are from my own research, but essentially we're seeing numbers doubling and tripling in a lot of states, you know, Florida, Colorado, and they looked at some data, they got continuous data from 22 states for a four year period, and they found that per capita detentions had increased three times faster than population growth. So it's just leapfrogging itself over short periods. They, they found numbers doubling in the space of five years, the number of people People being detained. So in half the country, that was 600,000 people, 1.2 million nationally, and that's about 357 detentions per 100,000 people. And only a relatively small percentage of those are actually repeat patients. So these are unique people in most cases. And now that's double or triple or more some of the rates in the UK and Western European countries. So both Canada and the United States are using this tool very aggressively, much more aggressively than elsewhere. So now people, you might ask, how can that be happening when we have so few beds? There aren't enough beds for these people. So that's another piece of this. It's just been very misleadingly represented. And there's a great study out. It's available on the web. And I can give you links for that if you get in touch. Uh, that's the title, Trend in Psychiatric Inpatient Capacity. 1970 to 2014, they couldn't get numbers back to 1950. But essentially, their argument was this hasn't really been looked at. This was the National Association of State Mental Health Programs directors, by the way, that did this study. And so right off the bat, the first number they hit at is how many were there in the 1950s? And they found that, well, actually, state hospitals back then had a wide variety of people, seniors with dementia, patients with, with brain injuries, alcohol problems, intellectual disabilities. So really 42% of those beds back in the 50s weren't even for psychiatric patients or what we would call a psychiatric patient today. So that immediately changes the, the comparison in a very significant way. So reminder, they said 11 beds. So the first thing the state mental health program directors found was, well, you don't just count state, state hospital beds. That's what that number's for. Hardly anybody's in state hospitals anymore except forensic psychiatric patients, uh, criminally charged patients. So nowadays, most people under civil mental health laws go to go to private psychiatric hospitals, general hospitals, Department of Depend De Defense and Veterans Administration hospitals. There's dedicated beds and nursing homes. So by the time they're done counting those, the number's 10 times higher already off the bat, just for inpatient beds, so hospital-like settings. Then we have to go further because they couldn't count. They didn't have good numbers for the emergency room psychiatric beds. And we know that 70% of hospitals are boarding in that way. We've got uh, psychiatric units in in uh, in prisons, we've got addiction treatment centers and more. These were largely uncounted and not included in their numbers. The next big one, and this is a huge one, is 24 out seven psychiatric beds in long-term care and assisted living, supportive housing, group homes, sober homes, and elsewhere. 
these were again, they did not count them, they didn't even try to count them, and these were not included. And this is actually largely where deinstitutionalized people went. They were shuttled into these smaller facilities and institutions today. And I'll show you some data in a moment about that. So very roughly, we look at these numbers, we, it was probably as low as 190 to 250 beds per 100,000 back in the 1950s. And it's as high as about 600 beds plus today. Now, I don't want to stand behind those numbers. These are things I really tried to just cobble together myself, pulling on things that the state mental health program directors couldn't pull together. So it's very rough and we need better numbers and better research. But definitely the dominant narrative is way off the map. It's not even close to accurate or true. And that's what we need to, as a society, grapple with. So now there have been some studies done. What actually happened to these discharged patients from, from prisons, I mean, sort of from, from asylums? Did they actually end up in prisons or unhoused? Because largely it's rhetoric. It's just all, people just go, well, you know, that's probably what happened, right? What else could have happened? Well, what did happen is they ended up elsewhere. And every study that actually followed those patients, like literally saying, let's find those people that were discharged find them today? Where are they? What are they doing? And so out of 23 studies in America, Canada, and other countries, 15 of them reported zero people were homeless from those discharged. And other studies, it was like one homeless person out of 163, seven out of, uh, out of 737. So very, very tiny numbers of people that were actually discharged from state hospitals ever ended up homeless. And out of, out of 18 studies they found that look at the imprisonment issues, 11 reported zero ended up in prison. And other studies, one out of 321 patients, two out of 700. So again, very few people that were discharged from these facilities when we actually track it ended up homeless or in prison. So that's a completely different population. And it may be just connected to the fact that there are motives that these institutions have for labeling people in prisons with mental disorders. So what's really going on, and this is what my book's largely about, and this is my last slide on this particular uh, stuff, but basically it's being used as social institutional management, uh, mental health laws. So lots of people and family and domestic conflicts and disputes are calling 911. That's how homeless people are often getting incarcerated under mental health laws is, is neighborhood associations or neighbors or businesses are just calling 911 to get rid of them. People People who call 91888 are also getting their calls tracked. Schools are using this tool against disruptive or distressed children. We've got data on that from Florida that's astounding, looking at the number of children that are getting taken up to psychiatric hospitals against their will. Long-term care and nursing homes use these laws and drugs for behavior control. Active duty soldiers and veterans, extensive use of mental health laws in that, in that space. Uh, and, and also they're adding to it. So it's even more than people who are technically involuntary um, on the books. A lot of them are just being threatened with decommissioning or pension loss and being forced into treatment. So technically they're not an involuntary patient, but they're still under coercion. And I found that extensive. So I believe that this tool is being used very extensively for social control in all sorts of other places. For example, the next on my list is workplaces. So I saw a lot of employees being threatened uh, with, with losing their license to practice in medical professions in social work, in nursing, and also conflict resolution processes in workplaces where just the underling employee, the person with less power, would be threatened with losing their job if they did not accept uh, tranquilizing medication or some other kind of treatment in the workplace. So uh, then I saw banks, airports, tax authorities, government agencies using uh, 911 and mental health laws as a rapid way of getting rid of complainants and protesters, often on some pretense or other that they were just unduly agitated or threatening in some way. And of course, guardianships is a massive area that, that, that this is being used. And again, all of those people would technically be uh, uh, voluntary patients. Fraud and profiteering was also widely used. 
uh, and, uh, and then extremely politicized uses. If these aren't political enough for you, uh, I saw extensively used uh, these kinds of laws again to control pregnant people, particularly if they were in any way uh, utilizing drugs, uh, recreational drugs in some capacity or otherwise coming to the attention of child and youth services. Climate activists are increasingly being pathologized in some way, particularly if their behaviors are seen as uh, uh, in some way challenging or threatening. And I saw it being used against whistleblowers. And underneath all this, these cultural drivers, which we've been talking about, the same prejudices that we see in society against the poor, against uh, different races, sexism, misogyny, homophobia, all of these same prejudices are at work. So um, yeah, that, that's it. I will uh, stop sharing my screen. So that's kind of my quick overview of the deinstitutionalization in summary never really happened. We transinstitutionalize people into these smaller, smaller places. And what's really happening is mental health laws are being much more aggressively used than they ever have been. So thank you very much. And I, yeah, turn it over to other people. Thank you so much, Rob, for that illuminating response. I think what really stood out to me is just how the data really does not correspond to the narrative that they're really trying to push out there that disinstitutionalization is the reason why we have this mental health crisis. And I think for me, what also stood out was just the numbers. We're saying that 50% of youth are being uh, projected to be part of the system. And we think about how the prison industrial complex has worked where they use test scores uh, from uh, preschoolers to kind of forecast how many prisons will be built. I can kind of see how maybe they might be using some of that to start to project, okay, how can we continue to build out the system? Because now we're targeting like half of the future uh, generations. And so just thinking about that, I want to transition to Theo and just ask Theo, how has involuntary commitment measures been weaponized against the unhoused communities? And how does this perpetuate cycles of oppression and harm? Well, I'm going to add a little bit more to the conversation on how it deals with school children. It goes a little bit farther than that. There are 50,000 LAUSD children that are unhoused in the community. And as you probably guessed, being unhoused is a very 24-hour uh, all-encompassing tax. That means their parents or their uh, caretakers are unhoused. So to that end, they would pro probably be deemed problematic defiant because of they may be sleep deprived or food deprived or uh, maybe behind on their homework. So this is one of the ways that they could fall into the system um, and be, be targeted. Uh, I also wanted to take a quick uh, side trip to understanding when a few years ago when the George Floyd crisis happened, um, people were galvanized uh, about the injustice, rightly so. But George Floyd was not the first person that had that happen to him. It was actually an unhoused person that was having another crisis by the name of Muhammad uh, Abdul Muyahim. And he was you trying to had a support dog and someone called the police because he had a support dog going to the restroom. And the police were called and instead of de-escalating the situation, they basically replicated the very harmful acts that ended his life, uh, George Floyd's life with uh, Mr. Muyahim's. So the idea is how it falls into, and I have to say, every intersection uh, from the housed community seem to be sometimes in agreement when they see unhoused people, even if their own intersections of the community as an underlying problem due to meritocracy, uh, respectability politics, um, or they may have had a short stint of houselessness and they say, well, this person just didn't want to uh, get help or so the best way to do is, is make it be forced to get help. Uh, one of the uh, conversations that I was a part of when they were talking about me was, uh, he doesn't want to uh, take uh, the assistance that they were offering. Mind you, it was carceral or it's going to be forced uh, uh, incarceral uh, uh, institutionalized kind of care. And I did not suffer any at the time of those type of maladies, 
But the point of it is, is that it plays a part in the conversation. If you go and look on any of the next door vigilante sites, you will hear the leading of cause of conversation about houselessness is mental health or substance usage. And I beg to give you more information is most people that do substance usage is when they become unhoused, not because of the result of being unhoused, as well as the, some of the uh, challenges that become, uh, that you see with people that are engaging in houselessness is the result of maybe sleep deprivation, uh, the hostility of su the survival and the, the lack of resources that are there to provide the same kind of healthy responses that house people will be able to tap into. I hope I answered the question. Yes, you did. And um, could you talk a little bit about just the trauma of trauma, uh, of institutionalization itself? For the quickest thing about, I always give you this, to be unhoused and to be institutionalized is a, in very real sense, a death sentence because it impacts your getting uh, services, it impacts you trying to get housing, it impacts you trying to get a job. It basically, if there, you had legitimate claims that you were being attacked or uh, the situation was not uh, germane to your survival, they will use that and weaponize it against you. And that's the dif uh, difficulty because uh, mainstream society look at houselessness uh, as a part of the remnants of the eugenics movement. Uh, which is why, you know, we had in the 50s, everyone was lumped into those places. The eugenics movement was one of the things is these are the detritus of society and we had to put them somewhere so we could erase them or to be able to explain them away from our mainstream society of san sanity. And it's the same thing what's going on with houselessness, not the exploding uh, unaffordable high, uh, housing costs, not the exploding housing is uh, food insecurity, not the uh, exploding antipathy against unhoused people. It's just the fact that they're using this as a version of social control and a weapon. Thank you so much, Theo. And you are right. And I love that we are specifically naming out uh, these things like eugenics. In a lot of these issues, what is happening is they are actually not naming the root cause of the issues. Like someone is mentioning in the chat, lack of sleep is a, has a tremendous impact on mental health. So you can imagine not being able to sleep for several days and still being required to function. Uh, somebody else also mentioned the privilege of how a lot of house people have the privilege of using their drugs privately uh, and having their worst moments behind closed doors. And house populations do not have that same privilege. So thank you so much for that. And with that, I would love to transition to Chaku. And so Chaku, as we just explore how, you know, we've already tackled this myth of the institutionalization talked about how um, it's just being used as this white cast net. And so we know that uh, Eric Adams announced this directive in New York City last year. What were your initial reactions? And since then, who has been most impacted and how have you seen this play out in New York City? All right. Thank you uh, for the question. And, you know, Theo, great, that was a really uh, wonderful set of remarks there. You know, I think the, so the, just going straight to the question, when the mayor put that announcement out, many of us weren't too surprised because we were already watching what was happening, both in the media and in the politics after this woman, Michelle Go was killed. And so um, in New York City, um, and so in a similar way, there was this traction growing, um, as Rob was pointing out, around using incidents of violence, even as small and numbers that they were, they'd be used by EF Tory and others very quickly to justify involuntary outpatient commitment, involuntary hospitalization, the call for more hospitalizations. So at that time, there was already a call for more hospital hospital 
um, uh, to be built, more beds, you know, so the call for more beds, especially after the pandemic was a dynamic, um, beds were supposedly taken down in order to actually increase capacity for COVID, and they wanted to scale those beds back up. Um, there was a call for something to be repealed that was called the IMD exclu exclusion, which kept um, psychiatric facilities basically from being able to take Medicaid, and that's part of how they uh, what they called deinstitutional, what Rob really well pointed out was, you know, not a deinstitutionalization technically in that sense, but was the way they stopped paying for hospitals in, in the country and started to move towards private uh, psychiatric hospitalization. Either way, anybody with over, I think it's 16 beds for psychiatric um, uh, care was considered an institute for Met mental disease and IMD. And so those, the advocacy to get IMDs paid for inpatient dollars, again, getting back to this industrial complex of this system, you know, this notion of needing and being dependent on bodies to actually fund them um, was intersecting with all of this. So getting back to the mayor's plan, there was combination of unhoused challenges in New York City that were challenging people, both in the business sector and a number of other areas. What are we going to do with these people? You would hear a lot of comment like that. And then on top of that, um, when Michelle Goh was killed, you saw advocates for forced treatment in the mayor's um, ear, basically. So he was being sold the same story that Rob and others were talking about, that this is the best way to get people care. This is the best way to make sure people are, are, are this. In fact, they were, he was given the whole dignity argument. It's undignified to leave people unhoused in the kinds of situations they're in and in the kind of needs that they're in. So it became kind of a civil argument around it is, it is their right. You know, we, how, who are we to hold people from the care that we can offer them? You know, and it was the same argument that was used to justify the uh, racial disparities and in involuntary outpatient commitment when it was happening in the first place. It's one of the first things we said were going to happen, just going back to the statewide um, call when Andrew Goldstein pushed Kendra Webdale on the, off the subway in New York City in 98. By 99, we had a law called assisted outpatient treatment. And that was our involuntary outpatient commitment law in New York. And the, 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 how fast that moved, man, there were 70 ACT teams, assertive community treatment teams funded immediately. And uh, Governor Pataki was really making it possible and making, it, making sure there was, there was a, a set of services to help these people stay on their meds is the way that was looked at, right? And so that's been scaled up even more. Now there's 108 ACT teams, there's youth ACT teams, there's, there's a number of systemic kind of strategies, including the increased um, investment in hospital. So it's, it's not just the mayor's plan, the subway safety plan, the mayor's plan. Since then, 1,300 removals um, have occurred um, of people based on something they call the expanded criteria of someone looking like they need uh, support to take care of themselves. So they expanded essentially the, cri the criteria was supposed to, they'd already expanded the criteria, by the way. I mean, the, in practice, the criteria was quite strict in terms of how many hospitalizations you've had to have, history of violence, all these kinds of, it, it became a conditional release, especially in the city. You couldn't leave Manhattan PC without a court order uh, petition of IOC, you know? So there was no way um, in, in fact, you know, so the numbers are quite strong. I mean, so 90 percent, 95 to 98 percent of all the petitions were resulting in court orders, right? Were resulting in actual um, court order treatment. And then, um, you know, thousands, you know, the majority of them were in the city. So out of 1,500 currently in the last 12 months, you're seeing a good uh, 900 of those to, you know, almost 1,000 being in from New York City. The other disparate, dis, you know, thing I want to point out is that it continues to be mostly black and brown people that are put under court order. They, 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 every time there's a, the Kendra's law, which is the uh, IOC law I'm referring to, gets under sunset period. It's actually never been made permanent. It's, we've been able to keep it from being made permanent. So it has a sunset period every five years. Every time it's gone through that sunset period, advocates for forced treatment try to expand the criteria 
and make it permanent. So it's, they make a run at it every time. And then the, the first run at it, um, we, uh, through the New York Lawyers for Public Interest and another number of groups, tried to make the, the reality known about um, the numbers of black and brown that were disproportionately under court order. Well, they decided to say, well, actually, actually, that's not a disparity. That's just a reflection of the whole system, which in some ways made my point that it was a racist system too, right? <laughs> it's a racist policy. It perpetuates this racial inequity. And it's a racist system that continues to put a disproportionate number of people with psychotic disorders, puts them into hospital, puts, re anyway, you see my point. Then they basically said, we're actually getting these people who normally wouldn't get care and be under a more restrictive level of care, better care through ILC. So it's not a disparity that we, we should worry about. It's actually something we're, we're improving. And it was all white researchers that said this, right? So, you know, it was every, it was, it was, we finally this year, this last year, this last sunset period, were able to call it out as racist and be more specific about that and have people catch, um, the understanding of that a little bit better. Again, the law stayed on the books. The expansion of the criteria exists in New York City. The capacity to remove people exists in New York City. Um, and I worry that, you know, because of the current budget climate with increased hospital beds actually being in the pipeline and no crisis response, there's no non-police crisis response in the budget currently. So we've been trying to get, after Daniel Prude was murdered by police here in Rochester, we've been trying to get um, uh, Daniel's law passed for a statewide non-police crisis intervention uh, strategy that would scale up um, uh, the support by a peer and EMT based on the CAHOOTS model out of Oregon. And um, we're still in that fight looking for, a, you know, we have a pilot proposed out of the Senate. We have a great Senate mental health chair, uh, Senator Brooke out of Rochester, who's my senator. You know, so she's personally been active in that that work, but we're still in that passing the budget negotiation right now. So I don't want to get too in the weeds about that. But the last point about that is that people still don't believe that a non-police intervention would be helpful. People still won't believe that a peer-based intervention would be helpful. Lived experience can't stand without without these other without a without a person with a gun dragging us into an ER. And I've heard advocates on councils like I serve on saying those exact words. So we're up against a lot, but I think the silence of the scientific community, the provider community, those you know, has to be changed in that regard. So I think I'll stop there for now. I know <laughs> I've said a lot, but I. Um, uh, there's a lot more to say, so um, I want to hear what other people have to say. Wow, wow, wow. Chaku, thank you so much for that, for naming how they weaponize language to, to, to enable them to be able to hold the systems and make it such that we cannot even hold the systems um, accountable for the harm. Um, and so I just wondered whether somebody had a comment for that, Theo. Did you have a comment to Chaku's remarks briefly before we move on? I just really quickly, I don't want to uh, belabor what he stated, but I exactly what is going on and particularly with the unhoused community. The language, language is important. The second thing I also pointed out before I, I shut up is the idea that even among our community members, like the social workers here in Los Angeles, that the 4118 language of a person that seems to be acting menacingly, or uh, it's a quality of life issue, or like, for example, uh, Mayor Bass, who has co-opted the movement uh, from the activists and saying it is undignified to have unhoused people out here on the street. So in, in essence, they are using the same language and the same strategies to co-opt and they also institutionalize these kind of uh, 4118 uh, bans, uh, the bicycle repair ban, anything that, uh, that is normal behavior that other human housed people do, that if unhoused people do it, it's criminalized because they are utilizing those survival tools to stay outside because they don't want any help or they're, or service resistant. That's a major big term in unhoused communities that they love to say, 
if you are not okay with being institutionalized or forced into carceral kind of conditions or solutions, and you want to have agency uh, to uh, get into treatment that you want. For example, if I was to ask you as a, a woman, um, I have a hotel, I have a home for you. And usually most reasonable women will ask, where is the place? Is it near uh, uh, transportation? You know, do I, you know, is it safe, the community, all of that? But unhoused women, uh, black and brown women don't get that thing. Or if they have children and they're concerned about their children, they can't have those same kind of concerns house, house families have. Because what people will see is they're being resistant. So that's the case to be institutionalized and separate their children. And these are the dichotomies, uh, the, uh, the relationships that is not really uh, seeing the nuances that we uh, miss in the conversation. Thank you so much, uh, Theo, for that. And Chaku and Theo have really just defined the landscape for us. And so we're now going to continue this discussion about how this is not new. And so I'm going to shift the question to James. So James, just take a moment to explain to us about care court and how that is another example of a measure to force people into care. And I'd like for you to just reflect back to us. What is the impact of this policy decisions on the ground and how are you and the anti-police terror project responding and how can people protect themselves? Uh, right on. Um, so care courts are the latest approach by our governor, Gavin Newsom, to, uh, to kind of disappear uh, the large number of unhoused communities across our state. Right, and so this is how they'll work. Uh, persons with diagnosed schizophrenia spectrum or other qualifying psychotic disorders may be referred to care courts by family, friends, first responders, or behavioral health workers. Those referred to care courts are then ushered into a system of involuntary treatment. Within this system, persons can be ordered to treatment, ordered to take medication, required to attend court hearings to ensure that they're adhering to their care plan. Right, after 12 months of this, this treatment, uh, the person is evaluated. And if it's determined that the person failed to complete their treatment, they can be referred to conservatorship, right? Care courts has been dressed up as the solution to houselessness uh, by our governor, Gavin Newsom. Uh, uh, Newsom and mayors across the state have engaged in a concerted effort to paint our unhoused neighbors as unwilling to engage with service providers and stubbornly insistent on sleeping outside in encampments and, and claims that they have no interest in a pathway to permanent supportive housing. That couldn't be further from the truth. What Oakland's unhoused are facing right now is a situation where they're completely ignored until housed residents and businesses complain about their presence, at which point the city comes in with the police, the Department of Public Works, and service providers in an attempt to constructively evict folks from their locations. Right? Unfortunately for the city, the legal landscape in California makes it very difficult for municipalities to conduct mass evictions of unhoused communities without uh, uh, available housing and services. So mayors, the governor, and those who support their neoliberal agenda have been desperate to develop more tools to effectively force many of those sleeping outside onto a pathway to conservatorship, right? From our perspective, that's their motivation for care courts, right? You all have to understand APTP has been fighting the city of Oakland to provide real housing options for the thousands of people who sleep on Oakland streets for years, right? But we don't see, uh, um, but our city and the state don't see people living on our streets uh, uh, in mental health crisis as a health and human services issue. They see it as a public safety issue that requires law enforcement, right? And so that means that hundreds of millions of dollars that could be spent on housing, mental health services, human services, and much more is instead spent on policing, full stop, right? In Oakland, we spend about 350 to $400 million a year on policing, right? Uh, 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 our officers make between 150 to $300,000 per year, right? Uh, and they spend most of their time responding to calls for non-criminal activity, right? By their own definition, non-criminal activity comprises about 50% of the calls they're responding to. And we know through several city audits, right, that what they're doing at encampments is just sitting around wasting time and wasting money, right? Providing a latent threat that if anyone who's unhoused doesn't toe the line, they will be punished by law enforcement. Right, this is what we've watched for eight years straight under Libby Schaaf, right? The city's consistently refused to provide any of the resources necessary to provide mental health solutions, to provide housing solutions to people in crisis, and instead going to uh, understanding that's much easier to criminalize them 
and to lock them up, right? And so, so enter care courts, right? The latest tool to make sure Newsom and his mayors uh, um, can force those uh, who require services that the city is not willing to provide, right? Uh, a, a pathway off of the streets by force, right? Said another way, the unhoused communities of the East Bay uh, are, are clear that the service and housing provide, pro, excuse me, that the serving service and housing options that were being offered are not acceptable. Right now, one of the primary options is this. You can live in a tiny shed with a stranger. You can bring two bags total, right? If you have a vehicle, you may not bring it. It's got to go somewhere else, which is impossible in the city. You lose your vehicle. If you have an animal, it may not enter, right? You're going to lose your animals, right? If you have people who you want to stay with, there, it's, un, it's unlikely that you'll be able to stay with them or that they'll be able to get into the same shelter, right? And after 90 days, there's no guarantee that anyone who's in that, that, that community will be able to stay there, right? So even if you say, okay, I believe you, I'm going to enter this, and after day 90, it's a gamble. It's a gamble, right? And so with those take it or leave it rules, people, a lot of people just say no. No, no, I'm not doing it. Right. And these are the people Newsom is saying need to be forced into involuntary treatment, need this care, right, are unwilling to accept any options or unreasonable. They, you know, they're completely reasonable. The options are terrible. They're unacceptable. There's no pathway to permanent supportive housing. There's no viable options for folks. Right. And so they just say no. Right. And, and, and unfortunately, uh, with the passage of care courts, you know, those who say no, the leaders in these communities, are going to be targeted. They're going to be given these diagnoses. They're going to be forced into care courts, and they're going to be pushed into encampments or into 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 these housing options uh, uh, that 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 they uh, um, don't want and have rejected. And if they say no, they're going to be deemed to have failed their care courts plan and going to be forced into conservatorship. Right. That's how they're going to get rid of the most difficult folks. Right. And what we're going to be left with uh, is a situation where the city is allowed to do its sweeps. Right. Because everyone understands the consequences if you don't. Um, got a little, got a little emotional. I, I went off my notes, but for the purpose of timing, I think I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. And so just before you stop, I was going to ask, what are some ways the people can actually protect themselves? As you were saying, you know, the people who are challenging this will be the most targeted. So could you give us any strategies? Uh, absolutely. We've been, uh, we've been partnering, uh, um, uh, unfortunately, this is something that is very difficult for folks to do on their own, right? And so, and so, uh, APTP uh, uh, has has been partnering with folks in encampments in Oakland to lift their voices up and give them a seat at the table and demand uh, and uh, fight back against the narrative that's unfortunately winning right now, right? May, Governor Newsom's whole, you know, these people need our help, care courts are right. That propaganda is winning. Right. And so folks need to the first thing folks need to do if they live in California is understand whether or not care courts are going to be starting in October for you, which is very specific for, for, for certain counties, or if this is something that's not going to be starting until the next year. Right. And then if this is uh, if this is something that's starting, excuse me, uh, if this is something that's starting in your location. Right. It's imperative uh, to get connected to advocates who know the rights under care court. Right, so folks can educate themselves in their communi communities as to exactly what can happen under the law, right? Because things are going to go very quickly when care courts start. These diagnoses are going to start rolling up very quickly, and so we just want to make sure everyone's apprised right now, right? So if they go in and someone's trying to diagnose them a certain way, they understand where that might be headed. Thank you so much, James, for that. That was very enlightening. And I think we've done a great job of just setting the landscape of how we got here, uh, how our racist, ableist practices are what continue to reinforce the systems and the people who are most impacted by this. And so as we shift the question to Kalichi, my question for you is, what happens when a person enters a system and is institutionalized? And we're not just talking during, but also after. And can you share some of the outcomes of forced care that you think need to be centered in this conversation? And just try to think about the well-intentioned person who resorts to these systems like 988 and reported mandating 
thinking that they're actually helping. Thank you. And everyone just did such a great job of setting the stage. Um, I think what well-intentioned people um, who might even consider themselves progressive don't realize when you when you force someone into treatment, when you take away someone's rights, you impact their ability to recover. And I would argue, and actually research shows that quote unquote non-compliance is actually showing an individual reaching recovery because they're saying, wait, this doesn't work for me. I don't want this. Um, and we can talk a little bit more about like why non-compliance is maybe healthy um, and what that might look like. But a lot of folks don't know that, again, when you're entering a, a system that is actually structurally racist and takes away your rights, um, you know, you may be forced into chemical restraints. So your medication is chosen for you. Your provider is chosen for you. If you even get a provider, they're not matching based on what you need. Um, it's already designed. Everything, and, and, and a lot of people um, who may have side effects, and I'm definitely one of those people who was forced into medication and the medication made me feel worse. This isn't true for everybody, but you don't even get to choose or advocate and say, this doesn't work for me, right? So being non-compliant around medication that might make you feel, I don't know, suicidal or make your symptoms worse is part of like being a human and having self-determination. You don't get to make those decisions. Someone else is making those decisions for you. So again, you don't get to choose your medication. You don't get to choose your provider. You don't get to choose where you live. And even with this particular framework or care for it, we don't even have housing, which was the whole argument for this propaganda in the first place. Um, you're not even getting matched. Um, you most likely won't get peer support, which is something that is evidence-based and shown that helps people as matching someone who has lived experience with them. And we are seeing more and more research saying that if you were forced into treatment, whether it's hospitalization, any sort, sort of force, your outcomes are worse. In fact, your rates for feeling suicidal or being suicidal, even if you didn't even come in with that at all, if that was not even your thing, because of the treatment you received, you're more likely to attempt or be at risk for that. So how are we putting people in places and making them more at risk for harm, right? And I wanna uplift my colleagues at the Coalition Against Forced Treatment. They did this huge research study uh, to understand people's experiences being hospitalized and also experiencing forced treatment globally. And some of their high level foundings just talked about the harmful experiences of being physically restrained, touched by staff, chemical restraints, seclusion. It's quite carceral. We don't, when we don't have these conversations, we don't think about the mental health industrial complex being very much like the carceral system, right? When you are isolated and alone and you're taken away from other people, that also impacts your mental health. Hate speech, and not to even mention if you are trans and you're in this system and they're like, oh, we already have a place for, we don't even identify you as a gender or an identity. We won't even acknowledge what your, what your name is, right? We're gonna, we might even diagnose you with gender dysmorphia and put you elsewhere. So these are some of the things to really consider that we are, putting people in a system that is not up to date, that is westernized, that is biomedical model, that is illness-based, that is not recovery oriented. And as we are watching people use different language, you'll see that they're co-opting recovery language to say, look, let's help these people. Let's give them, we might even have, they're starting to introduce peer support into care court, God help us, um, which is a horrible co-opting because being peer, it's self-determination. It is not forced treatment. So we're already seeing this language take over. So I just wanna be clear because some of the points and some of these conversations are saying, oh, it's not criminal court, it's civil. Let's be really clear. Forcing to someone to do something against their will is forced treatment. And if you need a civil commitment to help someone, it's forced. If there is a justice system involved, it's forced. If you can't get a taco at 3 a.m. when you want something, it's forced treatment. You're probably forced treatment. If you do not have auto, like um, autonomy over your body, 
over your rights, over your soul, over who you are with, who your support system is, that is forced treatment. You can package it any different way, but like, again, use that example as like, oh, is that forced treatment? And further, Black and brown people are more likely to be sub subjected to orders of force and under those orders are more likely to see harsher terms on those orders and harsher measures to enforce them. And this is going to further stigmatize our people. So those are just some things I wanted to say about like forced treatment. And I want to talk a little bit about non-compliance because we hear like non-compliance in many different words. I saw this post and I'm just going to read it. I don't know who it's attributed to. So if you ever find out who it is, please thank them. When we hear about non-compliance, maybe someone's not feeling safe with you. Maybe someone's not feeling safe in general. Maybe you're not hearing my concerns. Maybe the modality you're using is harmful. Maybe there's no flexibility in your approach. Maybe you haven't earned my trust. Maybe you're addressing the wrong thing. Maybe you're enacting oppression. Maybe you are not the best fit for me. So forced treatment undermines therapeutic relationships between if we're going on a clinical route between a client and a therapist and it magnifies these power differentials. So how are we gonna have mental health care when we are forced to be there, which already impacts our recovery because of the force. And then I'm gonna trust someone when I can't tell you, when, when you won't respond, when I say, I don't wanna use this, or I don't think I need this. This is, this is what I don't think people know. So when people are trying to do something for someone, we need to ask, why don't we have, why aren't you funding the community-based voluntary programs at all? Why aren't you doing, we know what works. Why aren't you funding that, right? This country was able to bail out a bank in like 48 hours and we can't figure out housing. Like it's a choice. So I'm gonna pause there, but cause I know we wanna get to the, to the end of this, but um, those are the things I just wanna uplift in the time we have. Oh, so much gratitude, Kalechi. You've opened so much for us to think about and just to sit with, and you've beautifully segued us, uh, segue us to our closing questions. I know we've discussed a lot and a lot of these issues just feel like very overwhelming and it's easy to feel like we are powerless, right? But the one thing that I want to uplift is the power of our communities, our shared collective wisdom that is ingrained in our DNA from all those who have come before us. And so I just want to ask each of you to just reflect and give your closing remarks on how can mental health providers, survivors, current and prior service users, activists and other advocates work together to resist this expansion of involuntary commitment directives and create a more liberated future for mental health care? And what concrete actions can we all take to resist after this panel? I'll just invite whoever is first to just unmute yourselves and just give us some brief uh, remarks. You can take a turn like that. Okay, I can go first. All right, I'll just get out of the way. So first of all, thank you, everyone. I just was so grateful to all the sharing that happened here. And um, there's so much more to be done. So I think, you know, what comes to mind immediately is a quote by a Sri Lankan activist, A.T. Ariadna. And A.T. Ariadna said very simply that when we try to bring about change in society, First, they'll dismiss you, then they'll ridicule you, then they'll push you around, then they'll oppress you, right? But then comes the most dangerous stage when they give you respect. And that requires a lot of reflection. You know, we're all participating in one way or another in order to be in the room or be at the table or be, you kind of get heard or, you know, or get seen. Yet at the same time, you know, like I was doing peer support in the closets of a psych center or in the, you know, where, wherever we could. But then when we were given the boardroom, I was like, oh, wait, what's going on? <laughs> why, why are they, why are they liking this so much? You know? Um, oh, I see. They like that we're starting to mimic some of their actions, you know? So that was the, we can, we are all at risk of recreating the same qualities 
that outraged us in the first place. So the very thing that we need to do with that is recognize where we are privileged to speak and do something with that. So um, when they use the term assert assisted outpatient treatment, correct them and say, actually, it's involuntary outpatient commitment. You know, um, when they use the term care court, correct them and say, well, it's actually forced treatment. You know, um, these are the things that um, start the conversation. And then obviously getting involved in the, I saw, I saw all the love for organizations like Wildflower and Intentional Peer Support and, and uh, Alternatives to Suicide and Hearing Voices Network. And there's advocacy organizations in New York, like Niapras. And I know some of you are there and national groups like NARPA. I saw Kathy there. You know, so there's a lot of great work to be done uh, and to galvanize. But I think what, you know, the struggle for me has been with those who are in the room, uh, not oftentimes saying it, you know for a risk of falling on the sword. So anyway, I'll stop there. Thanks. I can't tell you what to do. I just need to reflect on that. that... Um, I appreciate this conversation. The one thing I want to leave folks with is just uh, a keen understanding that the uh, folks our unhoused neighbors are um, at the intersections on this one and could really use our support, right? We've spent a lot of time at encampments and unfortunately when the evictions happen, the last folks who are left there are the people who are in deepest crisis, right? A lot of folks can figure out that it's time to get out of the way and they do and some folks are just left and, and we'll get and we'll, we'll deal with the police and that means that they could be harmed that means that they could be destabilized. That means that they can uh, uh, get a felony charge for over a misunderstanding, right? And have their life, you know, uh, spend the next several years in a, in a in a prison for for felony assault on an officer because they didn't understand what was happening at the time. Like, there's just so many situations that are happening where people with guns uh, are are um, threatening force on people who are in the most destabilizing periods of crisis. And we've found that having people there to advocate and at the very minimum, just witness, right? Shines a light on the state and prevents them from operating under the shroud of dark, behind the shroud of darkness, right? And so I'm not saying that we all need to tomorrow develop all of the tools to fight back against the state and happily ever after everything we can't, right? But we can go, we can go and we can uh, support our neighbors where they are, and we can help make sure that they're not alone, right? When the things that we're talking about in this conversation come to bear in the worst of circumstances. Quoting from Shirley Chisholm when they said, when she said, uh, if they don't invite you to the table, bring your own chair. I believe when I created We and House, um, when I um, I noticed the conversation, one of the things, the propaganda that's been winning was the anti-unhoused sentiment. And I wanted to do something different from the lens of the unhoused because I believe you can't silence, you can silence a revolutionary, but you can't silence a revolution. And many of the unhoused community were very uh, disturbed and pissed off about how we, they were being categorized and how that they were being treated. But due to other issues of fear of, of recrimination or being retaliated, they didn't have the venue as mainstream media offers. And so when I do my podcast, um, it, I, I notice a difference. I notice um, a way that it's, I, I didn't take it, I took it for granted in the beginning because I was getting my story out. I was getting my friends that were unhoused story out, but then I realized that there was something that was happening among the unhoused community. They were getting, their agency and their power back. They were getting a way to get back at the system and speaking on it. And I, su I submit to you, that's one of the things that I think we could do, which is what I love to uh, continue to do, is to go to unhoused communities, not just in Los Angeles, but other areas and give them that venue, that platform where they are the experts. Because this community we have here, we have where our lived experience. They, are, they have lived experience as well. For example, many house people would not know what the first things to do when they've become non-housed the first night. The second thing is how would they for access 
the resources there to feed themselves, to keep themselves from dying from hypothermia, which is a big thing that's going on despite we're in California, that is a very big cause of death for unhoused people. Uh, the issues of how they do harm reduction, the training of Narcan for unhoused people, uh, if they have people that are affected by substances, they are trained in that. You know, there I even met an unhoused man that was helping the unhoused people lance the boils that they had when they were having because of going to the doctor would create it more a carceral or more a criminal activity. So to open the world, to open the idea of that, creating a voice, creating a network with all of these great organizations, talking with them, but also uplifting the voices of the unhoused community because I'm that's because I eight years, eight plus years of living out here and every facet of it from the garbage can to the squatting in buildings, I could tell you that there is something uh, uh, revolutionary and moving for unhoused people to feel like that they can stand on their feet instead of on their knees. Um, I would just quote um, Kwasi Chapman and he says, we know the nightmare, so what is the dream? So we know the nightmare, we've lived the nightmare, but how can we radically imagine something different? And there are so many, I mean, I think about the advocates who are on the front lines, I think about you, Theo and James, who are like in there and I'm like, what is the peer support that they're getting and receiving? How can we all show up and hold space for each other as we're doing this work? Um, I wanna uplift Trans Lifeline because they're bomb and they also don't engage in non-consensual active rescue. And I asked, I actually asked someone there, I was like, how did you do that? They're like, oh, we divested from the police and we found funding that wouldn't do that. I was like, so you found a way to fund a way? They're like, yeah, we don't collect that data. I was like, it's not impossible. And it's like, ask people who were doing this, what they're doing and then create something similar. Um, and for you providers, how are you centering lived experience? The people most impacted by these policies are not in the room. And when they are in the room, their words are taken, repackaged and then, you know, no, we're not doing that. So how do we keep them in the room, keep them front of mind and really listen to their work? And what are we doing truly to talk about anti-racism in the policies. We have to start naming things. This is where how people get away with things because we're not comfortable naming it. That is racist. That is misogynistic. That is homophobic. That is trans, like let's call a spade a spade. Cause then, you know, all these progressive folks who are thinking they're doing good, when you tell them what they're doing, they might, they might slow down a little bit. They're like, well, I don't want to, I don't want part of that. So let's bring back the language and, and language is power, sadly, but it is, it is. Um, and let's really talk about how we're gonna, I don't know, really bring back true peer support to hold all of our advocates as they're doing this work so we don't burn out. This is hard work. We need each other. We need you all. And we need the scientists. We need the researchers who are quiet. We need all those people who just are quiet we need your voices because you're in rooms that I'm never gonna be in. Let's be real. I need you to speak as if my life matters because it does. And so does everyone else's life who has been truly impacted by all of this, this violence. So that's what I would add. Thank you. I just want to affirm and everything that everyone else has said on this, you know, and, and where I landed after, my experiences and, and my research. And, and I'll just sort of run through a few of the things that kind of coming at it from different angles that I think we can do and do much better. And definitely more housing and, and, and housing first type approaches. So supportive housing where that's voluntary, non-coercive housing. We need far more of that. And this enhanced community mutual aid, a couple of people were really emphasizing that. And I, I agree wholeheartedly, you know, we got to get all better at helping each other through those crisis moments so that people don't end up getting sucked into these systems. Um, and then just really, we need like better data gathering, uh, you know, as uh, Kelichi was highlighting in her talk, like 
there's no scientific evidence this is helping anybody, right? We, we don't have any. And at the very least, there's a duty of care here that these institutions should be tracking outcomes and showing us, well, what's happening to people who are going through these experiences? What do they report? What do their families report? Like put everybody at the table and let's find out what's happening to people. We're not doing that at all now. The data's really hard to find. Outcomes aren't being tracked. Um, so psychiatric advance directives would be great. They're, they're on the books in some jurisdictions, but nobody follows them. But if somebody could say, if I go into crisis, this is what I would like to have happen, that would be great. A great way of empowering a person to guide the process a little bit. It's important to highlight that the United Nations and the World Health Organization have now come out. They're anti-force organizations now, right? They, the, the World Health Organization has issued guidances to, to nation states and to, to state states, right, to how to reduce coercion and ultimately eliminate it from psychiatric care. They are against force. We need to forefront that more and more. Um, and they're, they're, they're looking at models that are going on around the world as to how to provide services in ways that don't involve coercion. And of course, there are many non-medical therapeutic options, which are not so strongly linked to force like medical interventions are. And there's so many more of these and you have to ask, why aren't they being implemented? And one of the reasons is because the legislation is medicalized. Psychiatrists, medical psychiatrists have the absolute power under mental health laws. They dictate the rules to everyone else, psychologists, counselors. So that needs to change. We need to really look at demedicalizing mental health laws. Th those people should not be in charge of this. And then at a high level, my last thing would just go, wow, we need more political organizing. There just isn't a lot. I know people are working in their communities and that's great to hear. I mean, but, uh, you know, we got to communicate more and there needs to be state and national level bodies that are bringing these initiatives together and people together and doing public education around this because, yeah, we are really losing the public education battle and the lobbying battle right now because we're terribly poorly organized. So, that's what I just say. Let, let's more of this. We need lots more of it and more people collaborating, connecting, networking, and doing public education and political activism. Wow, wow, wow. I just, I wanted to uh, bounce back a question back to James. I know Rob just mentioned the Psychiatric Advanced Directive. James, for anybody who doesn't know what that is, could you just give a brief overview of what it is and how that could really be helpful for someone who finds themselves caught in this uh, forced psychiatric hold? Sorry, can you say that one more time for me? Uh, could you just tell us a little bit of psychiatric advanced directives and how that could be a useful tool for anybody who finds themselves under a psychiatric hold? Oh, that's a good question. Maybe there's someone else who can give you a better answer than I can. I can take care of that, James. So is that okay, Tatya? Yes. So, 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 so advanced directives, and we, we, we were trying to use them as an alternative to an IOC, actually, when, we, when it was first being proposed. But they're in every state, they follow the Federal Self-Determination Act that was passed in uh, 1990. Every state was required to create regulations that would actually allow a person to identify either a person known as a healthcare agent to in their case of being determined incapable of making a treatment decision, they would have an agent to turn to or provide written instructions known as a living will that would actually say what you actually would want to happen in certain situations, right? So in New York State, for example, we have a healthcare proxy law that includes and encompasses both the written instructions of the living will that's supported by case law, and then the actual regulation that assigns an agent um, to act on my behalf. The thing that's really important for people to know about the advanced directive is that it only comes into play when you are, like in New York, having a treatment over objection hearing um, to be forced to uh, uh, determined incapable of making a treatment decision. Um, and when you're in crisis or all those kinds of things, any, any information about what you prefer already is your, your voice is already the strongest voice at that point. If you have these written instructions, however, they can inform people uh, better 
and let people know what you would, would prefer, but they don't get to dictate hospital choices or things like that. Um, but it can tell people ahead of time, this medication doesn't work for me. This class of medications don't work for me. Um, this, I don't want any medications, that kind of thing. Um, and they can be uh, more, in fact, even sometimes more uh, liable for not going with what you said, right? I mean, so there's, there's supposed to be good faith for actually following your directions. So it's unfortunately, as somebody's probably putting, pointing out in the chat, um, not utilized well. Um, even medical advanced directives are not utilized only up to 2% of the time. So similar to what Rob was saying, there, there needs to be much more traction given to them um, and look at your own state's policies. Can I just say one more thing about that? A lot of times advocates like NAMI and others love the advanced directives because they include something we call the Ulysses Clause. The Ulysses Clause allows you to check a box or actually say, don't listen to me, do this instead. You know, now in New York, we have a right to revoke um, so I can fire my agent if they do, don't do what I want. I can, I, can I can change my mind. I can change my directions. Um, but in some states, they've allowed this Ulysses clause to be what tells somebody, and Ulysses is the person that put himself on the mask on the ship and said, no matter what the sirens, no matter what I say, don't take me down, right? So they're saying, don't listen to my voice. So just watch out for that Ulysses clause in the law and in the advanced directives. Make sure you're saying I can change my mind when I want to. That's it. Thanks. Thank you so much uh, for all your closing remarks. I do have a few more moments for anybody who just wants to give. If it's a one-liner response on how can providers be allies and help resist? As somebody who has been in the different intersection, first from being a trained mental health professional to a community-based uh, executive who is at the forefront of creating programs that help a lot of on house uh, neighbors. I think one of the things that I have found to be really powerful is just beginning to change the language. Like instead of calling them clients, we love to call them neighbors because that allows us to be able to to reinstitute their humanity and see them as somebody who is worthy of our time, our affection, and our space. Because when somebody is a client, it relegates them to all these rules that are already deeply rooted and seated in a racist, ableist uh, environment. And so being able to change the language and in training of case managers, being able to train that language, creating um, just needs assessment that really emphasize the need for them to sit and ask questions. I will not tell you how many times where you will have case reports and it will be evident that the person did not take time to just ask questions that you would ask anybody, like, how was your day? Did you eat today? How is your family or the people who are your support? These were things, especially while I was working at the Substance Abuse Center, I found that those were questions that were never considered. And it was always, have you used today? And, uh, <laughs> What, what are your plans? Like if for the people who might uh, be struggling with suicidality, it was, what is your plan? Do you have access? And not, how are you feeling today? You know, how, when you woke up today, what, what, what wh where were you? You know, what do you need from me? And so just beginning to really center the experiences and feelings and emotions of the people who are right in front of us. And for those who are involved in this work as social workers, advocates, case managers, the one thing that I would just like to challenge you is make sure that you go in and you are present as an advocate. So many times when I was an ACT case manager, I would actually discover that when I did not go in with the, the neighbors, they were just dismissed. 
they would literally go in saying that my leg is paining and it's been bleeding for seven months. And the doctor's response will be like, here's a Tylenol. Uh, you, I know you're just trying to get stronger medication. And that's it. And so being able to tell providers, sit and listen, ask questions. They are deserving of your time. You will not dismiss them. So I think this is just some of the powerful ways that providers and allies in the community can begin to push back against some of this very um, reductionistic and violent uh, practices. And I think I see Kalechi has some uh, remarks and Theo too. So we'll start with Kalechi and then uh, Kalechi, you can hand it over to Theo. Yeah, I'll be really quick. I think something um, really helpful providers can do is actually tell people what will happen to them when they disclose things. That has been the most helpful. Like, if you say this, I have to do X. Are you sure you want to say that? And I know it's like a code switching, it's a thing, but that is how my provider has helped me stay where I need to be and not where I don't want to be. So trauma-informed care approaches of like, I'm going to be really clear. And also, helping change policies. Providers are living in different restrictive situations. Maybe they are not the ones who can change certain things, but I had a good friend, Jess Stolman Rainey said, you know, if it's a dumb law, you know, maybe find a way around it. People are very creative. You can help someone without incarcerating them. And so I would say providers can be very creative of how to help people, how to support them, how to keep people safe with and still have people have their self-dignity. So I said, I would say be creative. And you know, imagine someone you care about being in a, if you imagine your mom or someone actually who you love, I don't know if you love your mama, but if you love someone, what would, how would you treat them? If you wouldn't put them there, don't put me there. That's all I'll say. And Theo, it's yours. Oh, okay, thank you. I didn't want to uh, jump in. Uh, I want to say this because of my own experience. I, I wish more service providers understood the reality of being what it is to be unhoused. For example, one of the things that needs to be asked if I'm coming in there is like, this is very key. You know, how is the unhoused, what the community that you live in? Are you swept regularly? How often are you swept? Because if they are saying that they have illnesses or pain and injury, the chances are their medication is being thrown away and they can't stay on the medication. So when you have that, it's not that they are trying to cop drugs or sell drugs. It's because the city, like here in Los Angeles, takes all of your medication, all of your IDs and all of your valuable stuff to understand the reality is I don't have a place to store my medication. And I can't always do medication adherence policies like a house person and take it every two hours because I have I'm keep moving all the damn time or I'm moving all the damn time. I'm injured. I can't re recuperate. I broke my leg during the pandemic. It took me two hours to find a damn bathroom. It took me two hours. And then when I came back, I, you know, I'm not carrying all of my medication with me, you know, to try to find a bathroom. And if it's missing or it's thrown away, that brings back into the back into planet zero. And I think where house and, and, and house people to understand that the basic things that we take for granted, it's not, uh, it, it's, it's, it's a different reality. It's not everyone's trying to get over, everyone's not trying, it's the reality of nothing is permanent for unhoused people. There's a state of level of impermanence and that we need to understand. So when they come to you and they may be sleep deprived and they're, they're not high, they may be on uh, awake for three days and they behave like they're on substances or they have a break, a mental difference. That's because maybe they're being harassed. Like for example, we don't talk about, particularly house people don't talk about the house vigilantism that goes on with unhoused people. It's a reality. I've seen people pull guns on me or, or other unhoused people. They go out and attack unhoused people, call the police. And then with this care court situation, now they have the, a more of a power dynamic that they could call and institutionalize a person after victimizing them themselves. So those questions, those things, I really wish more of our activists and our, uh, our service providers really key into that. 
Wow. Uh, oh, sorry. Did you? Yes, ask? Rob. Uh, yeah, it, agreeing with everything everyone else is saying. I just want to add, as my in my perspective as a journalist, you know, I want to say like practitioners to be better allies, they need to stop lying about this. They're lying to the news media. They're lying to legislators all the time. At the very least, they can humbly say a very large percentage of people who've been through forced treatment hate it. They are not grateful. They are traumatized. And they have very legitimate, understandable reasons for refusing these drugs that are very dangerous and often ineffective. Like that, and they can still say some people really like it. It's benefited if they want to say that. But at the very least, be more honest than they're being right now. It's a complete whitewash out there. And it, it just, it drives me crazy. I don't know how any self-respecting, well-meaning practitioner is not speaking out. Why is it us? They should be speaking out in noise because they see it every day in these institutions. They see it every day in the streets. They, they know they're not helping. They know it's harming people. They know people are running away from them with very good reason often. And I just wish they would at least acknowledge that more more readily. I don't think we could have ended <laughs> on a more powerful uh, remark. I just want to thank our panelists for joining us today and sharing their expertise and lived experiences. I also want to thank our audience for joining us and participating in this vital conversation. I hope today's conversation and discussion has inspired us all to continue seeking out alternative approaches to mental health care that prioritize liberation and healing for all communities, particularly those most impacted by systematic oppression. There is so much we can do individually and collectively to fight back against these directives. So in the interest of transformative mental health, you can donate to continue this work, like the work that went in in putting together this panel and our ASL interpreters, and your money goes into building communities of practice around holistic, democratic, and transformative mental health practices and providing accessible education to the public. Thank you. Thank you, each and every one of you, for being here, for sharing your wisdom, for holding space, for your honesty. Thank you for your resources and for being you. I just want to say, Nedayo, please stay for one more minute for some important updates from Jesse. Ooh. Thank you, Tatiana, and thank you so much to all of our panelists. Um, this is Jesse speaking. Um, I'm the director of IDA for those who might have not have been with us at the introduction. And um, I just want to thank, yes, I want to thank the panelists. I want to thank our access team, our ASL interpreters and our captioners, and thank all of you so, so much for being here and being part of the conversation. Um, want to remind you that if you joined late, if you are um, not able to stay the entire time, we are recording this event and you'll be hearing from us in the next couple of days with the events recording, links to the resources that have been shared in the chat, both by the panelists, but also by those of you who have been in attendance. There's been so much, as there always is, really rich resource sharing and ways to stay in touch with your panelists and Ida. So on this uh, slide here are where you can find Ida, our website, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And if you have a couple more minutes, I know we're a few minutes over, um, I just wanna share a few more um, kind of Ida announcements and way to stay in community with us. So if you aren't already, I really want to invite you to become a member of IDA. Um, by doing so, you really join an amazing, inspiring community of people who are trying to resist and change the way that we're practicing care. This is people with lived experience, survivors, clinicians of many kinds, family members, artists, activists, researchers, and advocates. And um, in order to do so, there's just, um, I think someone will drop a link in the chat, fill out a short form on our website, affirm our principles and values, abide by our community agreements, and pay annual dues. Um, so that link will be coming and a couple more announcements. 
Um, if you haven't already, um, I wanted to share a little bit about a training series that we're running at IDA that we've been running since the fall called Crossroads of Crisis Dreams and Strategies for Collective Care. Um, this has been an eight part virtual training series that really, really builds on a lot of the themes that were raised over the course of this conversation and also the last decarcerating care in October. And so I just wanted to um, share an invitation and this link will be dropped in the chat as well, that if you um, haven't joined us yet, two things. One, the series isn't over yet. Um, we have two more classes left. The first is reorienting to emergency and the following final class in the series, Embodied Wisdom. But it's not too late to sign up. If you register today in this series, you get all of the recordings from classes that have been offered since November, um, including the crisis industry, which features Kalechi and a lot of other incredible folks. Um, so just wanting to uplift this for um, people who might be thirsty for more resources and knowledge after tonight. Um, and just to address the question I see in the chat, dues are annual. Um, and if dues are not accessible to you at this time, we invite you to email us. No one is turned away for lack of funds. And lastly, I think just one last thing, this was mentioned before from um, Tatiana, if you were inspired by this evening's conversation or any of the work that we're doing, I just really want to invite, I want to first uplift and celebrate that we are celebrating Ida's seven year anniversary this month, we're offering um, we're kind of launched this grassroots campaign to sustain our work and invite you. We, we wanna first thank anybody who donated anything to uh, register for this event. Truly it is grassroots support from you all that helps keep Ida operating. And so if you wanna see more from Decarcerating Care or trainings from Ida, a link is in the chat as a way to kind of celebrate, honor the work we've been doing and help um, sustain our future. So that is it, I think on our slide so we can take down the share. And I believe just gratitude. Thank you all again for being here. There's a feedback form in the chat. Um, we really hope to hear from you on that and shape our ongoing offerings. So thanks everybody.